This is the War Memorial in Stratford, Ontario, and it's typical of all the war memorials across Canada, in every village, in every town, and in every city. And these memorials are gateways to the First World War. Unfortunately, most Canadians have forgotten the First World War, and they don't realize that it was the greatest and most traumatic episode in our history. 400,000 Canadians went overseas between 1914 and 18, and 60,000 died for King and Empire. River Somme, flowing through the peaceful Somme Valley in northern France. So peaceful, one can almost forget what happened here. But locals will tell you, on damp days, you can still smell the rust in the air, from the shells, bullets, and barbed wire embedded in what is blood-soaked soil. For the Somme will forever be the graveyard of armies. valley, more than 24,000 Canadians were killed or wounded, just in this little valley. And this is the nature of the Somme fighting again. This is just a, uh, just push forward, push back, failed attack after failed attack, a little bit of success. It was really a slaughterhouse. This was a, an unbelievable slaughterhouse. July 1916, Sir Douglas Haig, the British Commander-in-Chief, a stubborn cavalry officer surprises his generals. He decides upon a dangerous gamble to break the deadlock that has reigned along the battle line stretching from Switzerland to the North Sea, the battle line known as the Western Front. Since the Allies foiled the German invasion of France in 1914, France alone has done most of the fighting. Now drained of men and on the verge of collapse, France puts pressure on Britain's top general. Haig responds and launches the largest British offensive ever against German positions on the ridges overlooking the Somme. Artillery fire of a hitherto unimagined intensity rolled and thundered on our front. And thousands of twitching flashes turned the western horizon into a sea of flowers. We knew we were on the verge this time of a battle such as the world had never seen. The young German soldier, huddling deep in his bunker that June morning, could not know how true his words would be. After eight days of unceasing bombardment, British guns fall silent at 7.30 in the morning, July the 1st, 1916. 120,000 volunteers go over the top, and General Haig's Battle of the Somme begins. Ordered forward at a walking pace, the men have no way of knowing that their artillery bombardment has failed. In the time it takes to go for a short stroll, tens of thousands of young Britons fall under a hail of bullets. Crouching in a second line of British trenches, waiting their turn, are 700 men from Britain's oldest colony, Newfoundland, not yet part of Canada. An hour after the initial assault, communications have broken down. Confusion is total. And thinking the attack is going well, Haig's officers order the Newfoundlanders forward.
This is Newfoundland Memorial Park at Beaumont Hamel. It's the best preserved battlefield of the First World War. It actually preserves all the battlefield of 1916, particularly where the Newfoundlanders were chopped up on July 1st. You get an incredible view from over here. Well, the Newfoundlanders attacked over this little piece of land here, and they suffered about 90% casualties. More, more than 300 were killed uh, that's out of 700 that went into the attack, but they were all killed in this little parcel of land between where we're standing and that tree over there. They never even got through the barbed wire. The first segment of the attack which took place over these trenches had failed completely, but the general got reports that there were some British troops in the German wire and who got into the German trenches. So they decided to order the Newfoundlanders forward who were about, oh, probably 200 yards behind us. And they had their work their way through these trenches with dead and wounded and the complete chaos of the, of the whole morning catastrophe ahead of them. So they walked through here and they basically didn't know where they were going. It gets quiet because all the fighting has died down and they climb out of these trenches and start their walk because they were walking because they're carrying so much equipment towards the Germans at, across no man's land. No man's land wasn't safe at all, and to be even less safe in the time to come because there was no other fighting on the flanks, so everything was quiet. Anyone who came out of the trenches at this point was the only guy the Germans were going to focus on, and that's exactly what happened to the Newfoundlanders. They started to get through the barbed wire entanglements, and you can still see some of the corkscrew stakes over there. They start to work their way across, and of course, the German artillery, which is on all these ridges, all these machine guns down here are just peppering these guys and they're dropping one after the other after the other. By the time they clear the British barbed wire, they go about another 50 meters and they're all gone. Of the Newfoundlanders, General Beauvoir de Lille said, it was a magnificent display of valor and only failed because dead men can advance no further. The slaughtered Newfoundlanders have become part of the bloodiest day in a thousand years of British history. 60,000 casualties in a few hours and hardly any ground gained. Unperturbed, Sir Douglas Haig declares the fight will continue, and it does, for another five months. By September, more than 100,000 young men lie buried on the Somme. General Haig looks north to Belgium and to the three Canadian divisions who've been fighting in Ypres for more than a year. A year before, in April 1915, Canada's army of businessmen, bookkeepers, salesmen, and students had confronted the first large-scale gas attack in history. It was their first battle. Too naive to retreat, they stood their ground, saved the city of Ypres, and built a reputation as fierce fighters. With the Canadians is a 53-year-old Anglican minister from Quebec City, Canon Frederick Scott, who, contemptuous of risk and disobeying orders, has smuggled himself into the front line. Rumors began to circulate that we Canadians were to go south, and the signs of the approaching pilgrimage began to manifest themselves. One did hope that the attack to the south would be the beginning of the end, and that peace would be restored to the shattered world. Also hearing the rumors is a tough, cynical Scot from Calgary, Alberta, Private Donald Fraser, who, like many Canadian soldiers, excels at stripping souvenirs from the bodies of dead Germans. It became known our destination was the Somme. Our Major informed us that we would have a pretty easy time as our artillery had threats well in hand, pulverizing his line so completely that the advance would practically be a walkover, and the wounds would be such that they'd only mean a nice little trip home. He seemed to believe this story himself, but it turned out quite different, the Major himself being one of the first to fall. Ordered south, it takes a week for Canada's three divisions, 60,000 men, to march from Ypres 
to what the Germans have come to call the bloodbath of the Somme. With each step closer to shell-shattered Albert, Private Fraser and his company see more and more signs of what is to come. The day was hot and we sweltered as we crept up the hilly road. One was amazed at the German entrenchments in this sector. The ground was honeycombed with deep dugouts and machine gun emplacements. We passed the remains of a German cemetery and on the road I stepped on the body of a Hun embedded in the soil. In Albert, which has received to date a fair amount of shelling, the Madonna and Child on the top of the cathedral spire are hanging over and swinging with the wind. The French claim that when they drop, the war will be over. One of the big superstitions of the First World War concerned the Golden Virgin at the top of this cathedral. It had been damaged from shelling and it had fallen at a 45 degree angle, angle falling down towards us. And the superstitious people of the time, which was everybody, considered the fact that if it fell, then the war would end, which in most cases meant the Germans would win. So the French engineers decided they would fix fate and they strapped it on so that the whole statue laid at this angle but was still secured and wouldn't fall. Canadian troops came through here in 1916 and everybody, every memoir, every soldier who was here remembers the Leaning Virgin. And it's an absolutely every memoir. It seemed to me as if there was something appropriate in the strange position the statue now occupied. For as the battalions marched past the church, it looked as if they were receiving a parting benediction from the infant savior, Canon Frederick Scott. Well, the men were very superstitious, and you can, you know, you can understand why. You know, one shell would kill one guy one day and not kill the other guy the next. Some men knew that they were going to die, and they would, they would go into a battle, even a light action, and sort of give away their goods or get their letters home, and they would always die. They seemed to have a premonition. On one hand, you could live, and on the other hand, you could die. And what makes the difference between the two of them? Just a twist of fate. So I think that's what really, really holds them to their superstitious beliefs. And they, I think every soldier had one, and I think this is true of the First World War or the Second World War or any war. We're just in the, the village of Auvillers near La Boiselle and it's in these fields beside us that the Canadian troops were moving up for the attack on September the 15th, 1916. All the men of the 2nd Division were marching up through this area. And what was interesting about it is every time they passed a ridge, the battle got worse. They, they were in Albert and it was not too badly damaged, but war was there. And then they'd pass the first ridge and they'd find more shell holes and more bodies. And by the time they got into this valley here, it was total destruction. They were amazed by the, the depth of the German defenses and the number of bodies that were unburied and laying around the area. The problem was they still had one more ridge to go at Pauziers where the whole thing would get that much worse. Every hour of the day, a steady stream of troops were passing between La Boiselle and Pauziers, bringing up rations, material, and ammunitions. A continuous queue of wounded were being brought down to the dressing stations, and pioneers were busy burying the dead in the new cemetery springing up. Arriving in the rubble of Pazier, Private Fraser and his company learn that it has taken Australian troops seven weeks and 23,000 casualties to fight their way brick by brick into the ruined village, now to be the Canadian jumping off point for the next phase of the Battle of the Somme. As we lay there in the darkness, the mind had every opportunity to run riot. One of our tough guys, Thibault, took a very serious religious view of things going so far as to say that he knew he was going to get it. His premonition turned out correct. He was dead in no man's land a few hours later.
The Psalm, September 15, 1916. Private Donald Fraser is just one of 30,000 Canadian soldiers waiting for the dawn. Part of a planned assault along a 13-kilometer front, the Canadian's job is to attack Sugar Trench, Candy Trench, and the fortified sugar refinery, all of which shield the Germans' next position, the fortified village of Corselette. This is the Australian memorial on the windmill at Pozieres, and nothing illustrates the fighting in this area like this monument, which is the remains of a windmill. This is the highest point on the Albert Bapalm Road, and the Australians captured it in August 1916. The village of Pozieres, which is just over here, was leveled in a similar fashion, and it was through these areas that the Canadians came in September to launch their attack on Corselette. Shivering to the bone, we were glad to get the news at about 3.30 to move up to the front line preparatory to attack. We moved upwards toward the junction of the trenches. After a few yards, we became jock-a-block. The trench was a jumble of soldiers. It was impossible to move backward or forward. The Canadians were going to be the left part of the, the attack, and it would start from the little red roof there, which is Moke Farm, and it would arc across these fields into the village of Corselette here. This is the Canadian responsibility. They had two divisions, or about 35,000 men, ready to attack these positions. And they walked through here and got into their frontline trenches, which are just in these fields, just in front of us, probably by 50 to 100 yards. The signal came like a bolt from the blue. Right on the second, the Allied barrage opened up with a roar that seemed to split the heavens. Looking along to the left, about 40 yards away, I caught the first glimpse of a khaki-clad figure climbing over the parapet. It was the start of the first wave, the 27th Battalion. One of those khaki-clad figures is 29-year-old Will Crossland, a private in the 27th Battalion, who's left his young wife and their first child, a baby boy, back in Winnipeg. Will Crossland's grandson is Director Harvey Crossland. What do you got there? Got a couple pieces. Here's a bone from something. And here's a little piece of shrapnel. It would have been fired at the Canadian trenches. This is the kind of stuff my grandfather was ducking, right? Huh? He'd be ducking this guy. This stuff killed uh, probably more than anything else, the shrapnel coming down in the high explosive shells. Got an eye for him. So we're so this is it. Literally, we're literally walking in the footsteps of our this is, this our is grandfathers, it, this right? Is exactly where it happened. This is uh, right where the, the 27th would been here. You know, within about 50 yards. Of course, by this time it's all exploding here because the uh, Canadian artillery is smashing them as far as they can get them. And you can see the trench, which would be right across that little low area. These are normally smaller men, so they'd be about maybe five foot four, five foot six. They'd have these huge packs. Now, sooner or later, the Germans would be coming out of their trenches and they'd be manning their machine guns. And then the German artillery would start firing back, so the shells would be popping up here, popping up there. And you still got a long way to go. I was up and over in a trice, running into shell holes, down and up for about 20 yards. The air was seething with shells. Bullets from the enemy rifles were whistling and swishing around my ears in hundreds. To this day, I cannot understand how anyone could have crossed that inferno alive. The first wave by this time is mostly down. Second wave is going, it's following. And they're just going to keep pushing. They're going to look for protection in shell holes, which is where a lot of the men would go. A lot of the wounded would crawl into a shell hole. In the meantime, there's Canadian troops attacking all across this arc, and British and New Zealand troops all through those woods over there. So this is a huge action, which is good for us because that means the Germans can't focus their artillery on us. 
So there's a better chance with those odds. Halfway across, the first wave seemed to melt, and we were in front, headed for Fritz, who was firing wildly and strong. And as the remnants of us were nearing bombing reach, we dropped, almost as one, into the shell holes. On my left at the edge of the shell hole, a few inches from my shoulder, a little ground flew up, and I saw that I was observed, and that a Fritz had just missed me. Pulling in my rifle, I lay quiet. Not a man was moving in no man's land, save the wounded, twisting and groaning in their agony. This is a piece of driving band off a shell. It's the little piece that goes around the base of it that makes it spin out of the barrel. So it's always made of copper and it's just shattered. It would be a big piece, probably from a shell about that wide. It just doesn't stop, does it, with the things that you this find here? This stuff is just, uh, the locals don't even pay attention to this. So while we're in the it's bean fields, so now we're really getting close to the village. So hopefully some Canadian troops on the flank are now getting into the trenches so you can feel a little bit more more confident. I looked over my shoulder and away to my left at the rear, a huge gray object reared itself into view. And slowly, very slowly, it crawled along like a gigantic toad, feeling its way across the shell-stricken field. I watched it coming, how painfully slow it traveled. Down and up the shell holes it clambered, a weird, ungainly monster, moving relentlessly forward. Suddenly, men from the ground looked up, rose as if from the dead, and running from the flanks to behind it, followed in the rear, as if to be in on a kill. The monster rearing up behind Private Fraser is Britain's secret weapon, the primitive 28-ton Mark I tank. Appearing on a battlefield for the first time, crawling ahead at just a few miles an hour, these tanks prove easy targets for German guns. But the tank that reaches Donald Fraser is, like several others, about to have a huge impact. It crossed Fritz's trenches a few yards away from me with hardly a jolt. It gave new life and vigor to our men. Seeing no one falling, I looked up and there met the gaze of some of my comrades in the shell holes. Instinctively, I jumped up and quickly, though warily, ran to where I could see into Fritz's trench. Down the trench about a hundred yards, several Huns minus rifles and equipment got out of their trench and were beating it back over the open, terrified at the approach of the tank. And they got in there, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and they took it. Well, thanks to our French friends. Well, it'd be better to have one of those on your side, I think. Your support wasn't quite, uh, quite great then. <laughs> So this is, this is the basic the battlefield as they're really coming in. You can see the sunken road running the course of that village. We'll go there. And you can see the little rise up to where the sugar refinery is. There's a lot of stiff fighting still to come. This was the most successful part of it. When I jumped into the trench, the sight I beheld for sheer bloodiness and murder baffles description. The Huns were terribly mangled. A German with a ruddy face, clean shaven and intelligent looking, was lying on his back on the firing step. At first, I wondered what had happened to him, for he appeared unmarked. His feet, however, were torn to shreds. He had a pleasant countenance and looked as if he was smiling in death. It was off of him that I took the Iron Cross ribbon. The successful assault on Sugar Trench, Candy Trench, and the Sugar Refinery has taken just 45 minutes but it has cost the Canadians one man for each second the attack lasted. Two and a half thousand dead, wounded and missing. One of the missing is Will Crossland. Overwhelmed by the first appearance of tanks and by the ferocity of the Canadian attack, German infantry flee their frontline trenches in one of the most successful Allied assaults on the morning of September 15, 1916. German artillery is quick to provide cover, however, for the retreating troops. Ordered not to outstrip their own artillery, the Canadians consolidate the morning's gains by taking shelter in the battered German trench system, just outside the fortified village of Corseland.
Learning that the Canadians are now so close to Corselet village, General Haig's staff orders them to capture it. An officer of the French-Canadian Van Duzium Regiment, or Van Duz, Captain Joseph Chabal, leads his men forward. We went Indian file along a communication trench leading to Candy Trench. It gave some shelter, but what a mess. The trench had been blown apart and was piled with dead Germans and Canadians from the morning's fighting. Horrible wounds. Blood everywhere. The men hesitated, but went forward, often stepping on dead bodies. Men that a few hours before had been as alive as we were, and we thought that soon we too would be cadavers, like them. This is uh, Corselet Village. This was the scene of the heavy fighting on the evening of September the 15th. This is the second phase of the attack, and the Canadian troops had now pushed into the village and are trying to push the Germans out. And you have to keep in mind that these houses would all be fortified. There'd be trenches, deep trenches, connecting everything. So they were really going into a major fortification, not just a village. So it's hard to imagine today. It's just a rural French village. But then it was hell. The remains of the village, its white houses and steeple of the church were lit up by the setting sun as we moved ahead. One shell exploded to our left. The lads shouted, hey, too far left, Fritz. The next one landed just between two platoons. Bat shot, Fritz, try again. And Fritz sent another one. Damn, right on target. Keep going, lads. The stretcher bearers will pick up the wounded. We don't have time, we've got work to do. In Corselet, the Germans desperately fight back, garden by garden, basement by basement. The battle degenerates into vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat, with the Canadians making great use of the bayonet, with which they are particularly handy. Fighting with a bayonet is a bitter struggle. You look right into each other's eyes. Rifles smash against each other. You bury a blow, you hit back, you faint. Then suddenly, slipping by his faint, you push the blade in, even as your enemy grabs the blade with his hands. To get the bayonet out, you have to pull with both hands. Or if it's cut on a bone, you have to hold the quivering buddy down with your boot. The Canadians take Corselet, but all through the night and for the next three days, Prussian regiments counterattack again and again. The big guns on both sides never let up, and by the evening of the 17th of September, there's not a single house standing. Corselet has been captured, but it no longer exists. So my grandfather never would have made it to here, no? Now your grandfather would have been killed back before or around Sugar Trench. That's where most of those guys went down. And the artillery fire. The thing is, of course, is is what happened to him. And so many of these people, they just they just were missing. So they would write to the Red Cross and they would write to the various guys in the unit. Many were already dead. And they they'd ask for information. And it was always he died a noble death. He didn't suffer. I mean, you know, he, you know, he, he died cheerfully, all this sort of stuff, all of the period. You know, they didn't want to hurt anybody. They didn't want to say he died of a sucking chest wound from a large shell. Madam, we regret to inform you that Private William Crossland was reported missing in action on September 15th, 1916. Well, what happened with your grandfather is that they apparently buried him because they had sent back one of his identity discs. In the late 1916, they, they went, the, men, the men went in with two dog tags, the dead meat tags, one green one and one round red one, and they would stay with the body. One would stay with the body, the other would go, uh, could be sent back for, to base with effects. And the issue was he was probably buried. They probably put up a cross, or maybe not, 
the, whatever they could do. But when the time came to clear up the battlefields in 1919, they couldn't find him or find him and identify him. So in all probability, he would have been found and been brought into the cemetery and buried as an unknown soldier. Here, so if he was an unknown soldier, where would he have ended up? Well, what's unique about the Canadian troops is that they all wore their number on their collar, so C-27. So he would have been identified as a 27th Battalion man. And there are a number of unidentified 27ths in the cemetery. This soldier here is a 27th Battalion man that was found in Corselet Village. And the probability is that probably about one in ten that he would be your grandfather. Wow. As they tour the captured German trenches, Canadian officers begin to question whether a few muddy holes are worth the lives of thousands of young men. And for the first time, a few of them dare criticize British tactics. But the British commander, Sir Douglas Haig, turns a deaf ear. He has already set his sights on a new objective, the longest German trench system on the Western Front, a menace to the British hold on the Somme ridges. Overriding all objections, the high command orders the Canadians to prepare to take Regina Trench before the winter rains can stop the fighting. Rumors filter down to the tired Canadians that something big is in the offing. In battlefield dressing stations, Canon Scott picks up on the somber mood. The army had set its teeth and was out to battle in grim earnest. But the price we had to pay for victory was indeed costly. And one's heart ached for the poor men and their awful struggle in that region of gloom and death. This is the valley that Regina Trench ran through. It was the longest trench on the Western Front and it was positioned in this little gully and it zigzagged across the front to about a mile and a half in that direction. The advantage of being in a gully like this meant that Canadian artillery couldn't locate the position very well and they couldn't hit the trench so they couldn't destroy the German positions inside of it. Secondly, it was defended by heavy belts of barbed wire all across these fields here, up the rise past the cemetery. The other thing that really started to happen at this time is that the high command, the British high command, started to put pressure on the Canadians to keep up the attacks. And these attacks that the Canadians were making here were not properly prepared. They didn't have enough artillery and often the wire wasn't cut and they had very little chance of success. And it's really because of these battles that the generalship of the Canadian Corps started to lose trust in the British high command. As they wait to attack Regina Trench, the autumn rains begin on the Somme. The trenches and dugouts are soon knee deep in water. Mist and rain mingle with the stench of dead men, dead mules, dead horses. In spite of its name, the Canadian's camp in Death Valley is one of the few relatively safe places near Regina Trench. Only a few dozen casualties a day from snipers' bullets, from big guns, from mortar shells. While merely crouching in a trench, eating a meal, or lighting a cigarette, hundreds of soldiers are killed each week by weapons they never see. Their deaths are simply referred to as trench wastage. The man was brought in who looked very pale and asked me piteously to get him some water. I told him I could not do so until the doctor had seen his wound. I went over to the table, and there I saw a sight too horrible to be described. A shell had burst at his feet, and his body from the waist down was shattered. Beyond this awful sight, 
I saw the white face turning from side to side and the parched lips asking for water. The man, thank God, did not suffer very acutely as the shock had been so great. I knelt down beside him and talked to him. He was a French Canadian and a Roman Catholic and as there happened to be no Roman Catholic chaplain present at the moment, I got him to repeat the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary and gave him the benediction. He died about half an hour afterward. After two disastrous failed attacks on Regina Trench, Canadian soldiers are forced to go to ground again. The season advances. It is getting colder, wetter, and muddier. But General Haig orders the Canadians to mount a new assault on Regina Trench using double the number of battalions. The attack is set for October the 8th. Well, on October the 8th, the Canadians along Death Valley and all across this field were supposed to capture Regina Trench. So at the jump off time, all across these fields, the Canadians are about probably around 3,000, 4,000 men came out of their trenches. So the men advanced up these hills right to get to the top here. And then they're starting to get into the barbed wire. They still haven't seen Regina Trench. It's still over this little rise here. But now they're running into real trouble because the artillery didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was to cut the barbed wire. So now the Germans are manning their positions and they're shooting at them with rifles and machine guns and they're having to go to ground. A lot of them are being killed. And it's at this point that their piper, James Richardson, decides to take the action into his hands. And he takes his pipes, as a lot of the Scottish units often had pipers attacking with them. He plays his pipes and he walks back and forth in front of the barbed wire and it managed to encourage the men so that they can get through the wire and they actually get into Regina Trench, which is just in this little gully down here. Richardson, for some reason, was not killed. How they missed him, I'll never know, and he went with the men into the trench. The unfortunate part was that the attack on all along that side had failed completely. They didn't even get into the trench. Over here, the Toronto regiments, there's two of them fighting here, were successfully in, in Regina Trench. But Richardson's men got in, and then later that night, as the Germans started to counterattack, they had to evacuate. The men, at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, started to pull out across these fields, evacuating all their gains for the day. Piper Richardson forgot his bagpipes, or so the story goes, he returns to the trench and was never seen again. Ordered to attack before their artillery can destroy enemy barbed wire and machine gun nests, the Canadians suffer huge losses and fail for a third time to take Regina Trench. But as he withdraws with the three exhausted Canadian divisions, Canon Scott learns that General Haig refuses to be deterred by this third failure. To renew the battle, he has ordered the newly formed 4th Canadian Division down to the Somme. In the 4th Division is a young captain yet to prove himself in battle. His name is Henry Hutton Scott, Canon Scott's second eldest son. When the 4th Division arrived to take over the line, I had the great joy of having my second son near me. From my window, I could see the officers and men of his battalion walking about in their lines. It was a great privilege to have his battalion so near, for I had many friends among their ranks. Canon Frederick Scott. Also with the 4th Division is 20-year-old Victor Wheeler. Diagnosed as having a weak heart, Victor has been told he will last no more than three months in the front line. Now, as he looks out over no man's land towards Regina Trench, Victor Wheeler celebrates his second month in the front line. Even before getting close to Regina Trench, we had lost 25 men killed or wounded. 
The incessant rains had turned the whole Somme area into a quagmire. The heavy guns thundered continuously. The earth convulsed as landmines planted 30 to 50 feet underground spawned, then exploded, shattering every living and inanimate thing. Madness and misery were everywhere. Good and brave men were helpless pawns, sometimes longing to be put out of their misery. On October 21st, the Canadians were once again ready to attack Regina Trench. And here was the men from Alberta with Victor Wheeler. It was the 87th with Henry Scott, who was Canon Scott's son. And they were ready to assault what was left of Regina Trench, which had just been pounded by the artillery continually through October. The attack took place right here, and they had a very short distance to go. The wires cut. In fact, Regina Trench almost didn't exist anymore. The dawn was now completely hidden by a dense smoke barrage laid down like a great woolen blanket to conceal our movements. My flesh seemed to take on ethereal form, and the foe's death-dealing steel-tipped bullets seemed to be passing through my weightless body as we advanced across the forbidding terrain. Victor Wheeler survives the attack on Regina Trench, and at dusk he returns to base camp. But others have not been so lucky, as Canon Scott is soon to learn. I heard a knock on the door, and there stood an old man with a letter in his hand. He handed me the letter, and then, taking my hand, he said to me in French, My brother, have courage. It is very sad. At once the truth flashed upon me, and I said, My son is dead. The old man shook my hand and said again, have courage, my brother. This whole section along here was taken on that morning. Unfortunately, one of those killed was Henry Scott, Canon Scott's son. And one of the most moving memoirs discusses Canon Scott coming here to try to find his son's grave right in this field. My only chance of finding my son's body lay in my making the journey before my son's battalion moved away. Huge shell holes half filled with water pitted the fields in every direction, and I had great difficulty to keep from sliding into them. I started at 6 a.m. for Death Valley, and then went to Regina Trench. I had brought a little sketch with me of the trenches, which showed the shell hole where it was supposed the body had been buried. I got the runner to try in another place, and still, we could find nothing. We tried once again, and after he had dug a little while, he came upon something white. It was my son's left hand, with a signet ring on it. The mist was lifting now, and the sun to the east was beginning to light the ground. We heard the crack of bullets, for the Germans were sniping us. I read the burial service, and then took off the ring. We made a small mound where the body lay. And then by quick dashes from shell hole to shell hole, we got back at last to the communication trench. In the five-month Battle of the Somme, it is estimated the Germans suffered as many as a half a million casualties. Sir Douglas Haig declares himself very pleased with such a result. In their few weeks on the Somme, the Canadians have suffered 25,000 dead, wounded, and missing for an advance of just four kilometers. After the war, they brought in a lot of isolated graves from the battlefields of Regina Trench and Desire Trench. And amongst the graves they found were the remains of Piper Richardson. Richardson had last been seen going back into Regina Trench to retrieve his pipes, and he'd never been heard of since. His bravery had already won him the Victoria Cross, and finally he was confirmed as killed in action. He was only 20 years old when he was killed. It is often said that what happened at the Somme was the beginning of the end of the British Empire, a generation disappeared. For the Canadians, it was their first great bloodletting 
the experience of a new kind of war, slaughter on a grand scale, something they swore would never happen to them again. The Battle of the Somme cost the British Empire half a million killed, wounded, and missing. This is the Thiepval Memorial, and it commemorates 73,000 British soldiers who have no known grave who are the missing of the Somme. And this monument, which is incredible, it really captures the loss of the Somme, all these men lost for so little. It was really a disaster. Well, there's going to be a lot more battles in the First World War like the Somme. And unfortunately, the generals have yet to learn their lessons.